Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webcast. I'm sitting here with Lynn Pollack, who is a clinical pharmacist and uh, also a health educator and a longtime friend of mine. And we're sitting here in my living room with some gathered friends who have an interest in CCSBI. Hi there. Yes, yeah, say hello, everyone. <laughs> hello. 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 They're off camera, but uh, you may recognize some of them uh, if they uh, choose to identify themselves or chip in with some questions as we go. You'll notice there's a chat window next to the uh, camera window that you're observing, and you can uh, register or log in or whatever Ustream requires, and you can actually type a, a chat question there. And, and we've got several people monitoring the chat here, so they will be able to um, uh, tell us if you have a question. It might help if you put asterisks in front of it or maybe type it in block capitals if we're ignoring it. Um, be nice in your comments. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're learning as we go. And so with this webcast, uh, today we're talking about the different drug issues that have come to light not only with multiple sclerosis, but also uh, CCSBI. And we're talking about some of these issues because these topics come up all the time on Facebook. People are bantering these questions from, from person to person. And so we've brought Lynn in here today to bring some clarity onto that and hopefully um, uh, you know, give us some guidance on where we might seek uh, to get these questions answered. So with that, Lynn, would you like to give a little bit of a background about yourself to introduce yourself a little bit better to the to the group? Okay. Um, well, as Sandra said, I'm a pharmacist, basically, but my role is is somewhat different than what you might think of as a pharmacist. I tend I have a private practice and I work mostly one on one or with groups of patients through either uh, coming to see me or through organizations that hire me to do that. So over the years, I've gone from you know, so I have an interest in drugs to really more of an interest in people and the effect of the drugs on the people. So I wouldn't say I'm an expert in MS drugs or drugs in general, but I, I can give you ideas on where to look. I can maybe help you with some um, questions that you've got and uh, those things that we can't deal with today. We've got a, a way of helping, uh, getting you online or be, being able to email in some of the uh, questions through this the organization so that I can answer them if I need some time to to look, because I've seen some of the questions that some of you had in already, so I had to already hit the books on a couple of occasions, so <laughs> I'm anticipating that some of the ones today might also be that. And, and my interest is partly because, he being here is partly because, well, Sandra's a good friend and I've known her for many, many years, so uh, you know, I've sort of seen life progress for her and I have a family member that also had in us, so there's, and I have some other friends that do as well, so it just seems to be around me. So it's one of those things that has grown as an interest more than um, a professional call and more of a personal interest as well. So hopefully I can help you today and I'll do my best. All right, well okay. with that we're going to um, start with some questions that were submitted in advance and these questions uh, basically have to do with uh, some of the alternative, the, the supplements and things that people might be looking to at this period in their life. So we'll start off with the, with the soft questions, I guess. Um, and um, and Lynn, uh, basically the first one is how can we, how can we tell um, the quality issues with the different types of supplements, um, you know, in terms of um, their effectiveness and, and detrimental effects. As consumers, when we go into the store, we look to buy supplements. How do we know what we're getting? Sandra thinks this is the soft question, but this is actually one of the hardest ones to answer because supplements are very difficult to assess, both from a, uh, an efficacy, efficacy point of view. Do they actually work? Do they work for everyone? Or are they, do they only work for the odd person? Um, Side effects we can sometimes come up with a little bit better. And even is the quality of that particular product that you're spending a lot of money on worth it? Mm -hmm. And those are really hard questions to answer. So maybe uh, I could start by just talking a little bit about um, the development of some of these things um, in terms of uh, quality of the product and price and where to look and that kind of thing. Um, they, you can't tell how good a product is by the price. So that's the first thing to know. Price has really not got a lot to do with it. Um, drugs are uh, supplements, I think of in terms of drugs in the sense that they have therapeutic effects. You're taking them to try and get some action from them. So I classify supplements and drugs and all of those things kind of as very similar. There, there's, there's differences because supplements have uh, 
they're, they often have less of an impact. Drugs kind of hit you with a sledgehammer often, whereas supplements might be a little bit more subtle. But in fact, you are trying to change something that's going on. So in a way, they have similarities. Um, if you were looking for good quality products, I, it's hard to assess it just by going and looking at the, at the bottle or taking someone's advice. So I think really what you have to find is some place you trust. And there are, and, and look around, and start to see, go to a couple of different pharmacies, go to a couple of different health food stores, and see what types of brands they have that are fairly common. And brands that are often, that are made in Canada, if you can, because at least we know that there are some quality assurance measures that are in there. Brands that are brought in from countries like India and some of the others, their quality assurance, they might be perfectly good products. I'm not saying they're not, I'm just saying that sometimes you don't get the same um, rigorous quality assurance processes. I know what happens. I taught for many years at an acupuncture college and even with some of the Chinese medicines and the herbs that they, that they brought in from China, they were always, you know, that sometimes things just weren't perfect. So we need to be careful where these products are made, just in, in hopes that by having good standards, you've got a good product. Um, in terms of whether they work or not, it's very hard to get excellent, really good evidence that's that's been assessed in broad groups of people to really determine if something works. And my philosophy has always been, if it doesn't hurt, then maybe it's worth trying in you for a particular reason. So the first, I almost look at, firstly, is there any reason why this you shouldn't try this? Because it's you don't want to hurt yourself or cause a problem or have an interaction or, or whatever in trying something. So finding out the side effects. And you can ask the pharmacist. They have rec they do have records. Some of, some of them are pretty um, conservative in types of information that they look at. Go online and look and see what people are saying and do a little bit of digging. There are some really good databases that have excellent information that have gone over all of the different studies and things. But a lot of those databases are ones which cost money to subscribe to, and they're expensive. And hopefully no one from the company that is about the one I'm going to talk about is, is actually listening, but what I know some people do is they pool it together, so they all, one person applies for the, for say, the online subscription, and then everyone pitches in a, a certain amount, and then you all use the password. So there are ways to do this, <laughs> um, and uh, you have to be a bit creative. And, the one that I use most often is called um, the Natural Medicines Comprehensive Database. And it, I think, gives a pretty good overview of um, different drugs or different supplements, what they're being used for, um, what potential problems there might be. Um, the other thing they do is they rate the evidence. So often you'll see it'll say possibly effective or probably effective or you know, has been proven to be effective So they, in the different um, conditions. So the Natural Medicines Comprehensive Database is a good one. It comes in a book form as well, but I, the online version is a good one because it, it's just easier to it's access. More up to date, it's more up-to-date in some ways. And the book is huge and very heavy. <laughs> I can hardly lift it, so I know some of you will have some difficulties manipulating it. But that, that's a good one. A lot of pharmacies will have it as a reference. So I know, we, you know if I'm ever in a pharmacy working, often people will come in and say, what do you know about this? And the pharmacists that I'm familiar with will look and see. So use them as resources and ask the questions. And particular, so that that's and I'll stop there on that. Before you start a supplement, because we don't have good evidence on whether something works or not a lot of the time, and it's all over the map, and people, you know, so some of the questions we're going to talk about later are things like turmeric and uh, you know things that are a little out there in terms of what works, what exactly does it do, how does it work, how much does it work, how much do you take. It's very hard to get these answers. And what I find happens when I talk to people a lot, they're on supplements for some period of time, and I'll say to them, while well, you're taking turmeric, as an example, is it working? Well, I'm not sure, but they're afraid to stop. <laughs> because it might be, but they don't know. And so they end up often, people end up often taking things that may or maybe not work, Maybe don't work for them, and maybe um, they're taking you know, two or three or four of them. Sometimes people will have you know, one prescription drug in a bag of supplements, mm -hmm. and but none of them do they know if they really work. So my suggestion is, because it's hard to get good evidence, 
most of the supplements aren't going to harm you. It's certainly in the short term, probably. You know, that's a generalization. I mean, each of you is different, and each of you is on different things. So I don't want to give you the impression they're all safe, because they're not. Ter you know, totally safe. But and do your research a little bit. Ask the pharmacist. Ask, look online. Look and see what you can find. But when you start a supplement, try and figure it out what you're trying to achieve. So if you think that you're taking it because it's supposed to decrease your pain levels or make your, you know, whatever, help you sleep, then, yeah. yeah, then jot down for yourself. You know, in the last week I have had pain levels. I'm pain. I have pain all day long. I have pain when I wake up. I have pain when I go to bed. Or this. Have something concrete because with supplements they don't always work quickly. Like sometimes if you take a drug, you can feel it right away because it's very strong. But supplements aren't, they're much more subtle. So when you start taking one, make sure you know what you're trying to do with it and also um, have an idea of what you're like right now so that in a month's time or several weeks' time when you look back to see if it's helping, you have a marker. You know, where am I today? And have I improved? Because if I haven't improved, either I'm going to give it another month's trial and do the same thing or I'm going to stop taking it. So that's the first thing with, with supplements. It's hard to get a good answer, but you can do little trials on yourself. But you need a good marker, <coughs> a benchmark to have at the beginning. And um, my other suggestion is don't start more than one supplement at a time, because you're, if you do start to see benefits, you're not going to know what it is that's working. And then you end up taking a bunch of things that aren't going to help you. And the more things, whether they're supplements or drugs, the more items you put into your body every day, um, the more chance you have of having as simple as stomach irritation or side effects or an adverse effect or an effect on your liver or whatever it might be. So you complicate things more the more you take sometimes. Yeah. While you're on the, on the subject of, of uh, supplements, could you talk a bit about testing? Like how do you know whether you're low in zinc? How do you know if you should get take any particular supplement and whether, yeah. never mind the effect, but how do you even know whether it's, it's well, worthwhile? Well, okay, it, it, that's, that's, a hard, that's a hard one too. With some things, um, there are concrete symptoms that people have when they're low in certain things. So you, you, know, you might look to see what, a what those deficiency symptoms might be for someone who is low in a particular vitamin, as an example. Uh, generally speaking, people aren't vitamin deficient in Canada. Now, vitamin D is a whole different ball of wax. But when we're talking about some of the other vitamins that are more easily accept, you know, acquired in food and that kind of thing, generally we're not a vitamin deficient country it, it, you know, relative to some others. But there are things like zinc and some of the other um, minerals perhaps that we, we might be and individuals might be. So um, become familiar with what some of the symptoms might be if you have them, and it's not just that you might have one of them, <laughs> vague one, but you know, we sort of see a pattern there, then give yourself a trial and try it for a period of, I would say, several weeks, if not a month or more, to really see if it has any benefit. So you have to kind of decide what it is you're trying to uh, work at. So if, if you think, if someone says, oh, I take zinc because I was, then find out what it might look like to be you know, what kinds of symptoms you might have if you're low in zinc, and then determine whether you need it at that point. Is there any objective testing that you can no, do there in is for some. There are for some things, and there's all, it, it's not commonly done, but you certainly can do levels on a variety of these, and they can be done through your doctor, and there are alternative methods to do it, um, and, and those are through naturopaths and variety of things, but there's a lot of controversy over whether some of those are really um, diagnostic or not. You know, I, I don't I don't know enough about the test to be able to say one is better than another and certain you know that sort of thing. But there are definitely tests you can do for certain types of things. So vitamin D, you can do zinc. There are a variety of them. Yeah. But they're not commonly done, unless you had some overt, obvious um, medical problem as a result of it. And okay. and what about the tumor then, Lynn? Okay, so what does tumor do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, good reading. <laughs> how, does it, how does it work? <laughs> Other than tasting delicious. Yeah, well, it tastes delicious and it's been used for a long time. And turmeric actually has an ingredient. As, uh, with all herbs, there's, uh, or su herbs particularly, or plant sourced supplements, there's the plant, and then people have gone down to say, well, when we take this drug or this herb, it makes me 
something happens. So then we have researchers that start to look at what is it that's in that particular herb that is causing that positive effect. And so we know that in turmeric, um, there are a number of different ingredients. One of them is called curcumin, which is a, what they think is the active ingredient in turmeric. And um, what they've done some studies on turmeric and on, on populations have used it for a variety of different reasons. They've um, found that it can affect um, lipid levels, it can affect um, blood pressure in some people, they can reduce blood pressure in some individuals. They found that it can affect a variety of different aspects, so uh, it really depends on what you're taking it for um, and what you want to achieve with it. The dose is very hard to uh, determine. I've seen anywhere from 500 milligrams to 2200 milligrams as a dose. Uh, wow. So there's no <laughs> there's no standard dose. So you really um, couldn't eat that. You'd have to swallow well, it. Well, although the reason that they found that turmeric had any benefit was because in certain populations where they use turmeric in their diets a lot, they noticed change, you know differences in um, the epidemiology of certain kinds of conditions. So they started to look at dietary sources and what they were, and also it's been used in in India in medicine for a long time. Mm. Well, turmeric's an interesting one, isn't it? Because mm. I mean. We talk about it being anti-inflammatory, but it really dramatically affects uh, liver breakdown of other drugs. And one of its issues is, can't it occasionally, you know, put people almost into a relative withdrawal? And an example might be clonazepam, yeah. which a lot of MS people might be on for yeah. their spasms. You know, not necessarily, and that's that's where the it depends on their liver pathways. It depends on your liver pathways, but it. In, in all that I looked at with in terms of interactions and any interactions that I've seen, certainly it is metabolized in the liver and it does affect it, but it, depending again on how much you use, it may have no effect whatsoever on the drugs that you're on. So it's difficult to, to really assess that. Uh, so it would depend, when, drug, when, you, when a person takes a drug or a supplement or a food for that matter, one of the places that the um, nutrients within that drug or the or within that food or the drug itself, where it goes is it goes via the uh, bloodstream into the liver. And the liver is a pretty amazing organ. And what it does often is it transforms what you've swallowed or what you've taken into something else. And it moves that particular drug or nutrient or whatever along to either inactivate it or increase its strength or activity. And so there are different pathways that different drugs and foods and supplements can take and within the liver. And some some drugs, if they go through, or some supplement in a drug or food in a drug at the same time, if they go through the same pathway around the same time or they're in the body at the same time, they can interact with each other and either increase or decrease the effect of one or the other of the, sub, the substances that that person has taken. So we are able to now with drugs in particular, and we're learning more and more about herbs, detect exactly which pathway in the liver those particular substances will take, and then uh, predict or at least theorize, and in some cases see clinically, that there are these interactions. Now, all interactions that go through the liver aren't bad. Um, sometimes they're used positively, one to enhance another. But, but Bill's right, there are times when you can have certain drugs and certain supplements, turmeric may be one with, with, with certain drugs, where at certain doses, you can, f and depending again on your stability on that other drug, you may actually see changes in the way that that drug works, which could be positive or negative, depending on what the, what the drug is. So that whole idea of interactions is, and, and I thank you for bringing it up, because it's really important. We didn't talk about it in supplements yet, but when I think of supplements, as I said, I think of them as drugs, because one of the things they can do is interact in big ways, some positive, some negative, with some of the drugs that you're taking as well. So they're not just sort of simple, um, safe things to take any more than a grapefruit is with your the drug you might be using to lower your cholesterol, where there's an interaction. Yes. So there are interactions all over the place when you put two substances of any kind into your body. 
So, and, and you're right, turmeric for, it is often used for its anti-inflammatory properties. It can, and uh, I think this question also said, how does it take in? Or how how does, does it take okay, it? How do, so turmeric, um, you'll get better absorbed. It's not really well absorbed orally, but food will increase its absorption to some degree. So it's best to take it with food. Um, it also has been used topically for very specific anti-inflammatory, anti-irritant um, kind of effects. But it itself, because of what turmeric is, it can actually irritate the skin as well where it's applied. So if you happen to be one of those people that's applying it for a reason to a particular area of pain or irritation or whatever, um, be careful because you can actually have irritation from the actual turmeric itself. But in general, orally is how is the, the way that the majority of people will use it. Um, the dose is not set, and there are a variety of different dosages that, depending on what sort of circumstance you're trying to achieve, that they've tried, and uh, with food will help the absorption of it to, to some degree. So, and probably one of the reasons why some of the doses seem high, even 500 to 2200 milligrams, probably the reason they seem high is because to get enough of an effect, if in fact you're trying to achieve one, you probably have to push the, the amount of turmeric you take to be able to extract and absorb out the amount of um, curcumin and other um, ingredients that you want to actually have. So will it turn your skin orange when you rub it? <laughs> well, it is yellow. <laughs> Just kidding. So, it won't turn your but skin orange, but you will see it. Will, um, like if you were using it as part of your cooking, um, what's the do in, in certain cultures? Uh, any idea, like I mean, use half a tablespoon or half a teaspoon, does that equal a pill, uh, 500 milligrams, I don't know what, like, how does, how does this sort of balance well, 500 out? milligrams or would probably be, I don't know if you can see this, but a capsule about, I'm trying to guess, maybe, how long is that? I don't do centimeters very well, so three quarters of an inch, <laughs> and about, about half an inch wide, so it would be a fairly big capsule, maybe two. To those so that size. So yeah, we know how big I would say. So, so you wouldn't be using If you it? take, um, pardon me. You wouldn't be using it then as part of your, as part you of cooking. You could put it in know. food, or yeah. you could swallow it. It really depends how you want to use it. But you know, it, these, it's hard to hard to assess it. But if you take, um, like a tablespoon is is uh, 15 mils, which could be, it's probably heavier than 15 milligrams though. So it's hard to really measure that out without having a bit of a scale. What you could do is get someone to measure it out for you and then just eyeball it after that. Because it's not exact, nothing's exact. But you're going to need a fair amount over the day. It doesn't have to be all at once, but over the day, you're going to want to take a large, a large proportion of it in your food. So I think in food, it's probably hard to get all of everything that you want. Because one of the doses is the lowest dose that I saw used regularly for. Uh, pain and inflammation was around 500 milligrams three times a day. So I, you'd have to use, I, I don't see how you could get that strictly by putting it in your food. Mm -hmm. and, and is this the same as, as food grade that you would go get to the, at the store? Turmeric yeah, or yeah, it's, just it's exactly mm -hmm. the same thing? Mm -hmm. okay. Alrighty, well what about uh, green tea then and the benefits of green tea? So uh, I, I'd like to ask how many people take green tea. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Why not? Because there are we know and in green tea. I can show you. I was went on the Comprehensive Medicines database, and it unlike most things, which has about a, a write up about half a page long, this one had three and four pages because there's so much information on green tea, and so many things that we are hoping for and that we can see over time, perhaps, that have a benefit of green tea, or if green tea's been a benefit. So in green tea, as in turmeric and most herbs, or most foods, there are uh, ingredients which are considered to be the active ingredient, and there are within green tea um, it, uh, types of substances which are, are, are types of phenols which are the, are the actual parts of the, of the plant that do the work. So catechins, you might have heard of a term called catechin. You'll see um, EGCG. You'll see a variety of different um, letters around it, usually with an E and a C and a G in some order that will indicate that this is an ingredient that came from green tea. So if you see a supplement that has EGCG or ECG or something like that on it, um, those that indicates that it contains some of the active ingredients that you can find in green tea. 
So green tea has a wide variety of actions, and it has actions that are, um, again, on everything from cardiovascular, where the uh, effects on blood flow, on lipids, on clotting to some degree. They have effects on uh, mood in some patients they've found. Uh, they've seen ingredients within green tea that may have an effect on um, things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Uh, because it, the, the actual ingredients in it will link into a variety of different substances. It can connect to, it, it can affect receptors in the body, which we'll talk about a little further. It can affect some of the metabolic processes that are going on in the body. It has a wide range of where some of these different compounds kind of fit in. So that it, we look at it in a, in a broad base, everything from hoping to uh, change uh, or stimulate or, or affect the immune system in some way to, to helping to um, kill off certain types of cancer cells to um, cardiovascular general health uh, antioxidant properties. So green tea has a huge amount of potential benefit. And again, with a lot of it, of, of all of the herbs out there, you know, the, the sort of scientific evidence that, that you would expect for a drug, which we can sort of question at times too, but it, what, that we would expect isn't there with, with nutritional supplements, which green tea would be considered. And but of all of those sort of nutritional supplements or herbal supplements, it is one of the ones that have done a lot of studying relative to the vast majority of the others. And there does seem to be some really significant beneficial effects of green tea for some people. However, you have to consume it, and you have to consume it for a period of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it has to be a routine thing that you do. It isn't something that you can have a sip of every now and then and expect to reap the benefit. It has to be part of your natural diet. And the so I was trying to get a sense of how much green tea would you actually have to drink to, to derive some benefits from it. And they, they say that the average Asian diet um, has about three cups of green tea in it a day. And that's where they started to see some of the you know, sort of connected beneficial effects. So I, it, it, and the assessments of how much green tea you would have to drink ranged everywhere from at least one, one cup a day to 10. So. Uh, and and does it have to be a tea or does it well, come in a pill? It, it probably does come in a pill, but there are some processes with heating and that sort yeah. of thing that might, all, that might um, change it. The, the, the issue with with any kind of um, nutritional supplement, herbal supplement, is always there's there are those purists in herbal terms who say that you have to, you know, consume the complete plant or you have to consume the, the part of the plant mm -hmm. that is causing the effect. Um, that by extracting out the active ingredient mm -hmm. or by purifying it, somehow you change the overall benefit of the product because. When we look at green tea as an example, and we isolate out those parts of it that we think are the active ingredients, is it the fact that they're all three of them, or all four of them, or five of them, or whatever, all together in that plant that's making the effect, or is it just the fact that there's one really good one in there, and we can pull it out and it'll do the job? That's not, if you talk to herbalists, they say always, use the herb, don't, don't you know, and use it the right way. And and there are changes made in tea when you do heat it, because yes. it does. So, so my suggestion would be, and most of the um, research that I saw was on the actual tea itself, not on the leaves or you know, whatever. Okay. In, in a powdered form. I guess it's probably not leaves, but whatever part of it is. Mm -hmm. Leaves, a variety of different parts. It so makes sense. Yeah. So, it, and it's not, you know, it, it's always uncertain, but if, if, you know, in terms of herbal supplements, the more, the closer you are to the the plant, the plant source, then um, you may be losing benefit by looking at just the isolated um, product. It's hard to know. Not necessarily always, but that's that's kind of a the herbalist viewpoint on it for sure. Well, good. Well, let's move on to vitamin D, the big one uh, yeah. that you said is in a category all by itself. Um, what? Uh, <coughs> What are your recommendations, uh, you know, tablet versus uh, liquid, and and, uh, and how much do we take? Um, if our GPs won't test us, how do we know how much, or if we're even deficient? Yeah. You know, okay, so 
There's been a lot in the lot in the news, a lot uh, with about vitamin D, particularly for those of us that live in the northern climates. <laughs> live, you know, in Canada, and we get less sun than we do if you live right by the equator. And they do, they have shown that there's a decrease in vitamin D in a large number of patients, but a large number of MS patients too, a high population of those. So, you know, there's a lot of thought about you know, could vitamin D be part of the problem for all kinds of things, cancers and MS and all sorts of issues. And so now that we, we seem to go through these periods where different vitamins are the, the, the big supplements. So we've been through the vitamin C with Linus Pauling and the cold and all of that. And vitamin D happens to be it right now. But there does appear to be some substantial evidence, at least. It's not hard, core, fast scientific evidence, but it's good evidence to show that vitamin D might be responsible or at least in part implicated in a variety of things. The tricky bit is we don't really know what the exact recommended dose is to take. So, you know, is it 400 international units? Is it 4,000 international units? There are all kinds of people in the, in the sort of the spectrum. So, I would say that in general, if you didn't have MS and you were just sort of an average person in the population, uh, you know, 400 international units a day is probably the minimum. And it's been the minimum for many years as to you know, how much we should use. It's crept up to 800. In general, right now, I'd say 1,000 international units is kind of an average amount that even reasonably conservative organizations like Osteoporosis Canada and some of the others are recommending on a regular basis. There are people that who routinely take 2,000, and that, I, for many people, is considered you know, the daily maximum. We don't really know. We don't know. How, what will happen if you take 10,000 every day? We don't know. Because vitamin D is fat soluble. In other words, it can accumulate, but it doesn't happen very often for us. Um, so we don't have really strong evidence to show. Some of the studies they did in some of the MS patients were in the 25,000 range, or, you know, they were very high. So, but no one has actually established that upper limit, absolutely. Um, they say that if you go out in the sun without sunscreen and you know a reasonable amount <laughs> uncovered, not with your hat and and under your your UV protective gear, that you know, your body can produce tens of thousands of international units in not too much time, really exposure to the sun. So, as to the upper limit, we don't know. But I, if I was, if someone were to ask me what they should take every day, uh, my usual recommendation is around a thousand. And that's somebody without any neurological. Well, even with that, only because, well, I might go up as far as 2,000 because I don't know what the upper limit is and we don't know yet. But having said that, we know that there are people that are taking 4,000 a day and doing fine. Um, so that's, you know, it, it's hard to give an upper limit because we don't know what it is. So what, oh, oh sorry, go um, My son is taking 6,000 a day mm -hmm. and I'm trying to take 4,000 a day. What would we present with if it was harm, harming us in any way, or would we present in any way? Yeah, so how do you know if you're taking? Yeah, well, actually, yeah, I have never actually seen anybody with um, vitamin D levels that are way too high. I don't know if you have, Bill. What, no, it's extremely uncommon. <laughs> yeah. To see them way too high, they're probably very safe. Yeah. Even up to 450 yeah. uh, millimoles per liter, even though, you know, on. Vancouver Island, their upper limit suggested is 150, and I find for most people to get to 150, they need to be on four to six thousand per yeah. day. Yeah. And you know, I often think of that as a so-called therapeutic range for someone with a significant health challenge where vitamin D makes a difference. Mm -hmm. For example, the University of California, San Francisco, did a really nice study on vitamin D and MS patients, and the higher you kept your vitamin D, the less attacks you would have. Yeah. You know, it was quite profound. You know, if you had it in the 150 range by our units in Canada, then you could reduce your tax roughly by a half. You're talking about... MS, you're talking about, you're not talking about dose though, you're talking about the actual testing. Well, I'm talking levels. about the yeah. blood testing and yeah. the dose to get there, for most people, it's four to six thousand. Yeah. 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 Um, when they measure people even in Phoenix and people on 400, two-thirds of people are on very low, yeah. have very low measurements. Um, 
We don't measure them often enough. I honestly don't. Think. Well, you know, I hardly. Because I don't think I've different. ever. I've seen. I mean, I see hundreds of patients in a month. And I don't think that I've seen anybody who's ever had their vitamin D levels tested. <coughs> anybody who I know. had vitamin D levels tested. It's just not something that's routine. Every and person I see, yeah. I measure, yeah. and at least half the time they're in their boots. Yeah. Unless they're taking yeah. four or six thousand a day. So I think that, you know, it's, again, we don't know for sure mm -hmm. uh, what the level is. I don't think there's any problem with taking high doses. You're suggesting four to six thousand. Um, yeah. The standard conservative is, is 1,000, or they say 800, but no one thinks 800 anymore. It's at least 1,000. There's and very convincing probably, evidence that you can take 10,000 for okay. six months yeah. with impunity. That's right. And the, the tricky bit is not knowing how much long, you know, if you can do oh, it for 20 years and, and be okay. Mm -hmm. Chances are you probably could, because if you lived in the sunshine and you were out there, you might actually be producing large yeah. amounts of vitamin D every day at that same level. So it's hard to tell. But we'll We've been only, very conservative yeah. with vitamin D, but we don't have a lot of good evidence to explain why. We'll only make it here four yeah. months. Yeah. Four months of the year is all we make vitamin That's D right. in this That's part right. of Canada. Right. So here we have to be more aggressive. And do we have to take or should we be taking something else with it to make it do its job? Or? No. No. Okay. No, I, don't, I don't normally. Some people, and I've seen some... You know, some people said, well, I always take it with, uh, because it's fat soluble, I always take it with something fatty at the time that I take it. Uh, but frankly, it's better to take it and, and than not take it and not to worry too much about exactly when you're taking it, just get it in there. Uh, and there are very few drugs and supplements where you have to take it exactly with food or without or a certain type of food to get an effect. I mean, relative to the numbers that are there, there's a small group of them. Vitamin D wouldn't be one of those that I would consider. I would just, the most important thing is if you're, especially if you've got other things, is take it at a time, you're going to remember it and get it in there every day. And what about the liquid uh, versus tablet forms? Well, you know, th th there's, there's those people that, and those, the, some will say it has to be liquid, but to be honest, the vast majority of people are using tablet. So I would say tablet is probably just fine if that's what you can get. It's hard to find the liquid relative to the tablets. Almost all vitamin D supplements that are commonly purchased are, are tablets. So certainly you can use a tablet and get some results from it. Now, does it matter whether they're expensive or no. whether they're cheap? No, but you want vitamin D3. Because there's more than one kind of vitamin D. So you want to make sure you're using vitamin D3. Okay. And, that, and to be honest, that, well, we certainly in pharmacies, most most vitamin D supplements will be D3. I'm not sure about any place else, but it'll tell you on the label. And okay. you want the international units to be in vitamin D3 as opposed to the total vitamin D if it has more than one kind. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. And even if you were on a multivitamin, it would be a D3 typically that they would Usually have. They would, that's what they would put in there most often, yeah. Okay. Well, um, moving on to our last uh, mineral question, I think, is on the iron. And uh, I know a lot of us uh, jumped on this when uh, Dr. Zamboni's theory came out about, uh, you know, uh, are we taking too much iron in our diet? Are we, you know, should, you know, is, is this iron build up in our brain anything to do with that? And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, just this whole thing of if you don't have great blood flow, uh, if you haven't had uh, had uh, your stenosis treated, uh, should you be on an iron-rich diet? Well, I'm not sure you should be on an iron-rich diet. And again, you know, feel free to jump in or anybody else that's got information on this. But I mean, your body does need some iron, <laughs> and 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 so if you need iron to transport your oxygen around, you need iron for you know, it has to be there. So if you are you know, generally considered to be uh, deficient in your iron stores or deficient in iron, somehow you've got to have the other parts of you functioning well. So uh, it would seem to me that there would be situations where iron supplementation would be reasonable. But the problem isn't having necessarily too much iron, it's that it's not yeah. circulating properly. Mm. So well, and I think an iron comment that, that I would suggest is that certainly folks that consume extra iron. So this would be women in their reproductive years because they're having monthly periods. It would also be athletes, women or men, because they tend to break down red cells and there tends to be more loss of iron. So they may need it. Whereas anybody, 
uh, other what a non-athlete and a postmenopausal woman and most men do not need iron supplementation and the unless other, they're losing it somehow. Well, that's right, and that that would be the only thing. So iron isn't something that you would just automatically take. Sometimes you'll find in a multivitamin vitamin there's a little bit of iron, but that that's you know, only a small percentage of that is absorbed. But in general, the average person in the population wouldn't use it unless they've been, for some reason or other, tested to be low in iron, and that was a problem and they were anemic and they needed to have iron. That it's not something you would, we would all just go and do. I think it goes across to the other thing that we're now checking more is for hemochromatosis mm -hmm. and people that have high ferritin stores, which can be suggestive of that. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones that we need to determine because certainly in Italy, when they spoke about it, there's three genetic groups of hemochromatosis, and two of them are heavily associated with secondary progressive and primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think, uh, yeah, I actually made that note about hemochromatosis, because uh, several people you know, have, have both. They have MS and they have this hemochromatosis happening, so we've got, uh, you know, that's just, I don't know if that's just anecdotal right now, or there's some link in the there's some studies to, to link the two. Uh, you know, so obviously this iron issue uh, is uh, is out there, and and if we've got too much building up in our brains, then uh, you know who knows whether you know collation is the answer um, down the road or phlebotomy, <laughs> where they actually do remove uh, you know half a liter of blood or whatever on, an, on occasion, so people often will have phlebotomies. So there's other ways of, there are ways of reducing iron. You thought you had too much. Yes, but that, you know, you would also want to be, that would have to be something that's really supervised and supervised. It's not something, obviously, any of those things that you would do without having some supervision. Absolutely. So on the iron thing then, any, any other issues with iron? Um, then we're going to move on to LDN, uh, low dose naltrexone, and um, this person wanted to know how does it work? <laughs> <laughs> because you know, <laughs> okay, so low dose naltrexone. I have to start off by saying that there's some, you know, there's some really interesting evidence to to look it's for the to sort of substantiate the use of low dose naltrexone in a variety of different conditions. One of those. Um, and how it works is it's going to be it's going to sound a little counterintuitive, so I, I have to step back a bit because whenever a um, a drug or a substance goes into the body, the first thing one of the things it has to do to actually cause an effect is it has to attach to something. So it has to attach to like a like a key in the lock. It has to go into what we call a receptor site. And so um, naltrexone is a drug which we call a receptor antagonist. In other words, when it goes and attaches to that receptor site, nothing can happen. It's like putting a key that fits in the lock in a lock, but you can't actually open the door because you've got the wrong one, you've got to put a different one in. So an antagonist is something which basically blocks the effect or the ability of another drug or substance to attach to a, an area where it's going to elicit an effect. So naltrexone is a drug which is a, a narcotic or an opioid antagonist. So it attaches to receptors in your body that are sensitive to narcotics that you take, but also that respond to your own natural opioids, which would be things like endorphins or enkephalins. The other thing about receptors is that um, they don't all do the same thing, even though the same drug or the same substance attaches to it. So depending on where the receptor is in the body, or depending on what part of the nervous system the receptor is involved in, when a drug or a chemical attaches to that receptor, you might get a different action. So if, it, if or for a narcotic, for instance, it might attach to one type of receptor and cause you to feel drowsy. Another time, it might uh, attach to another receptor and cause you to have less pain, etc. So it has. There are a variety of places that these, these substances can attach. So when we say that you're taking something like naltrexone, which blocks receptors, um, especially at the really low dose that, we're, that they talk about, and it's at least a tenfold reduction in dose than, and more than what you would normally see it used for addiction or whatever. Uh, when, when we say that it's attaching, 
it doesn't it's not like putting up a brick wall and nothing can get by it it just basically impedes the attachment of your natural endorphins and enkephalins to attach to those particular receptors. it doesn't actually stop it absolutely because the dose is too low so one of the things they think happens well there's two things one the first thing is they think that when you um, when naltrexone in low doses attaches to receptors it's only going to attach to some of them not all of them and only to some that do certain types of activities and there are still going to be other opioid receptors that are going to make you feel better they're going to increase your mood they might make you feel less pain that are not going to be as effective by the use of these low dose products and what your body will do automatically because it's pretty amazing is that when you start to block the ability of the endorphins to attach to certain receptors it starts to increase the effectiveness or the ability of other receptors that aren't blocked to attach to your endorphins. So it, what they call upregulates or increases mm -hmm. the ability of other areas to attach to a particular substance, and in this case to endorphins or enkephalins or some of the internal and in what we call endogenous opioids and other things that are things like your own internal narcotics. So the, so what naltrexone does is that it basically makes certain parts of your system more um, efficient at using the endorphins that you have. Okay, so you start to see effects like uh, feeling better, just generally feeling more um, positive about things. Maybe a reduction in some pain, maybe a decrease in some spasming. Um, there are a variety of things that they've shown, but many of the studies that they've looked at with um, the use of naltrexone have been on quality of life, not just hard, fast symptoms, but also are you just you know are, are things better for you um, in general? And that's a, that's a harder thing to to assess sometimes, but that's one of the things that they definitely have shown with with many of these studies is that there's a difference in people's perception of their quality of life, which is a positive thing. I mean, that's that's not a bad thing. <laughs> we all need better quality of life. So uh, whether or not it, it's going to ultimately be um, able to do anything to reduce or change the course of MS, we're not sure. Um, whether it's going to have concrete symptom changes, uh, that's you know, a lot of the evidence is still fairly small, but it's it's ten trending in that direction. But they're definitely, in all of the studies that I've seen, have all have been increase in quality of life for patients with MS. Um, the other thing that um, they're looking at is the effects of um, endorphins and your own natural narcotics on the actual, on the immune system and the effects of that on the development or the progression or the changes in MS. And they're hoping that this drug will fit in there somewhere. Um, again, those are also long studies that have to go on, so a lot of that hard evidence isn't there, but they're looking at the, the way of using it. So, you know, it's one of those things that it, it seems to have a lot of potential. Um, and again, for any one person, there might be benefits, and for some others, there may be not. And we may only, maybe we don't even know the best way of using it yet. You know, we, we've tried it in a variety of different ways. Uh, with doses at bedtime, etc. But you know, maybe there's other ways of doing it. But right now, with the way that they're studying it and the way they're trying it, it certainly looks like it's a, a positive thing for, for the people that have tried to tried to use it. And is it widely available? I know doctors don't necessarily prescribe it, but are pharmacies dispensing it? Well, no, because I don't think it's actually available in, in the dose levels that uh, the dosages that are um, like it's not commercially available. Um, it would have to be compounded, so which is not impossible to do. There are compounding pharmacies all over the place, but it is something that would obviously have to be prescribed because of the type of drug that it is. It's not something that you can just buy without a prescription, um, but it, it can be made. It can be accessible. There's no doubt. Okay. Yes, do, Peggy. Do people who do not have MS or just like an average person? Um, would it be beneficial to that person to take it if it's an overall well-being? Um, well, it's hard. I would say no in general, but because taking something just to feel better probably isn't, unless you've got a reason to. I don't. I don't normally recommend it. There are some downsides to using any of this stuff, but 
they have you tried it in all kinds of other situations. So for instance, they often are, you know, so for people who are in surgery, for instance, and they're using um, narcotic pain relievers, they've now found that if the, with, with the trials that they've done with low dose naltrexone, they can actually decrease the amount of narcotic that a person might need for pain relief and extend, in many cases, the duration of action of that narcotic, by and thereby decreasing side effects and problems that have resulted from the use of that drug. Because and it's it, it, they, it, that has to do, at least my understanding of what they think it has, the way they think it works is that um, when you take a narcotic, your you know how some you hear about people becoming dependent on narcotics because what happens with narcotics is your body narcotics mimic the actions of your natural endorphins of your natural uh, uh, opiates opiates that you've got in your body so endorphins and kefalins and they give you morphine or codeine or whatever to try and mimic the effects of that. So over time, your body is sort of stimulated to become um, needing more, become more dependent, become tolerant to that dose. And what they think using the, the um, naltrexone does is, it's, is that it blocks a bit of that ability of the body to sort of need more. So that in fact, by working on blocking the receptors, uh, it decreases the stimulation that goes on that increases the person's need for more narcotic. And so they actually will use it now sometime, and in these studies anyway, where they've used them with patients with just for, for pain control, where they've seen lower doses, longer duration of action of their morphine or their, their narcotic analgesic by also giving them a small amount of a, a narcotic antagonist. And it seems so ridiculous in some ways to think you're going to block narcotics and you're going to take less. <laughs> it seems so counterintuitive, but it has to do with that whole process the stimulation of the nervous system, the development of receptor sites, etc., that we talked about earlier. So it's it's kind of complicated, <laughs> and no one really, you know, it, it's not hard and fast. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think it's an interesting one because even now, when I was at the World Pain Congress in Montreal last summer, you know, now we've got two or three in Canada combination of narcotics with narcotic antagonists, yeah. and sometimes it's to block the gut side effects of the narcotics. This is, you know, things like I think the trade name is Targan, but it's a combination of oxycodone and naloxone, which primarily works on the gut, so people don't get as constipated as they would have otherwise. But you know, related to your question, who would you think about it in? I would prescribe it in anyone that's with a chronic illness like cancer mm -hmm. or um, Crohn's disease. It's had some dramatic effects. 85% feel better. Two thirds will go into remission with the study. And then, of course, MS. It's it was only done on advanced primary progressive patients, and they had the improvement of quality of life that you mentioned. I don't think it was statistical that they could actually maybe reduce their muscle spasm, but I don't think anybody's tried it in the other milder components of MS. And then Dr. Younger at Stanford has continued and it's been only in abstract form so far is on fibromyalgia patients with some degree of benefit. So it, it's like many things, it won't work for everyone, but it is worth maybe a several months trial in people to see if they're one that does well with it. Because yeah. it's very, I think, safe. Yeah. Has Parkinson's been one of those? Yeah, there hasn't been a study done that I'm aware of. No, I, I didn't see any in Parkinson's specifically. Um, you know, I think most of the ones I saw were the ones that you mentioned. But you know, in, in terms of your question, should everyone take it? No. But in terms of those people that have specific issues that they want to deal with, and where you know, a lot of the symptoms that we talked about are involved, and some of the um, immune-related um, conditions, yes, it seems like there's some, maybe some benefit to those. So all the ones that you mentioned. Well, I was lucky enough to speak in, in March to Tom Gilhooley, who's from Scotland, and of course have done done this for probably 15 years in Britain and in the UK, and there is a lot of it used there. And he's now starting to do it The people with terrible, terrible allergies. Some of them can seem to have their immune system modulated with the low-dose naltrexone. So, you know, there's not many downsides. I mean, the biggest expense is compounding it because it yeah. comes in its yeah. 50 milligram size, and, yeah. and we're usually using it in the one to four and a half milligrams, with dose being quite a variable among people, it seems. Yeah, yeah. The only ones that I've, I've made are in the so three milligram range. That's the, most, the one I see that I'm most familiar with. But yeah. hmm. so it has it. You know, the immune system. 
you, you live with the consequences of it to some degree. But it is a pretty amazing thing. <laughs> and there's so much that we don't know. And every time you tweak one thing, something else happens. And that's the one thing you have to remember about your body is that it's so integrated that it has amazing capacity to override. It's like collateral vessels forming when you have a blockage. If, if you block one thing or change one thing, there are going to be consequences no matter how you look at it. Sometimes those consequences are really positive. Sometimes we don't really understand them. And that's, I think, we're just starting to really get a sense of where um, a low-dose naltrexone will go. Well, we have one more question that is just uh, general uh, MS uh, related, and then the rest of the questions will deal uh, more with CCSVI and its uh, um, uh, drug drugs that are involved in that. And that's the one on leaky gut uh, syndrome. Um, uh, basically, uh, uh, what drugs or supplements uh, might help with the leaky gut uh, syndrome diagnosis and any other information you can provide to help manage it with multiple sclerosis? Um, well, leaky gut syndrome is basically a way of describing increased permeability of the intestinal tract. Uh, and there, um, it's been <coughs> implicated, or there are groups of people who implicate it. It's, it's not, I have to say that it's not a hard and fast medical diagnosis. But having said that, there is a lot of, um, a lot of information about it, a lot of ways of look at it. There, are, there are ideas of ways of, of trying to treat it. But because we don't understand it 100% perfectly, if even in, in, in if it is actually truly a, a medical condition or whether it's just something that, that occurs as a result of other things, it's hard to know. You know, the chicken and egg to some degree, whether it causes or um, it's part of a process. But in general, there are ways in situations where your gut can become um, less patented. It, beca it can become a bit leaky, in other words, and it doesn't just leak things out in the way that you would. It's not like a, uh, a hole in a hose. But it, it basically means that things that shouldn't um, get into your body through your gut can do that. So for some, uh, for some reasons, whether it's um, something that's just innate in you, or whether it's a fungal infection, or whether it's a change in your gut um, bacteria that are, make your, uh, your gut more um, uh, prone to having damage to it or, or allowing things through or like an inflammation maybe it, well there's probably inflammation involved one of the ideas is that it allows inflammatory um, chemicals to you know to sort of infiltrate into the body um, there are drugs which have been implicated things that can be irritating to the gut things like anti-inflammatory agents which seems like a, again you know if it's inflammation why would anti-inflammatories but because they are innately irritating to some degree um, there are a variety of things which have been implicated in causing this so and there have been studies done on showing by changes of diet and by improving the effects of or the the symptoms of leaky gut, that in fact some certain conditions like some of the inflammatory bowel diseases and that sort of thing have been improved by certain changes which are meant to try and treat leaky gut syndrome. So in terms of, I think the question was what drugs can cause it and what kinds of things can we do. So again, you know, I'm willing to take any suggestions that people here have as well on ideas because a lot of the issues are around um, decreasing the risks of candida. Uh, if any of you have got a sort of an antifungal diet or a, a diet to try and de decrease candida, which is a type of uh, fungal infection that people have in their diet, in their in their bodies at times. So decreasing sugars, decreasing um, refined carbohydrates, trying to eat you know a lot of fiber, healthy foods, having a, a good, solid, healthy diet is, is one way. Also using things that help with digesting. So there are digestive enzymes that people have tried as supplements to work with uh, leaky gut. So uh, for instance, you can there are a variety of different enzymes, like there's one called Codezyme, for instance, that are often used by people with cystic fibrosis and other <coughs> types of, of diseases. But in general, what they do is they, these particular products contain some of the enzymes that you would find in your gut that would help you digest fat and protein, et cetera. So you can get supplements to do that to use with that. There are also probiotics. Some of you might have used them. They contain uh, bacteria which repopulate the gut and try and get the intestines back to the normal environment. Like your intestine is a pretty um, balanced ecosystem. And so when something throws it off, 
either you have diarrhea or you take an antibiotic, which wipes out a lot of the bacteria. Um, you know, the, the balance that you have in there with all of the different organisms that live quite happily together is totally disruptive for a lot of people. And some people don't bounce back from that very well because it, it, the changes are not possible to, to bounce back from for, for partic their particular reason. So sometimes they need to repopulate the gut with things like a probiotic or you know active culture yogurts or things like that in their diet. So those are some of the common supplements that people use. Um, also, L-glutamine is one that people use. It's amino acid that um, has been used, and I've seen um, doses in the 500 or more, three times a day range. So that using some of the amino acid supplements, I've seen um, recommendations for all type, various types of herbs, um, marshmallow root, slippery elm. There are a variety of different uh, supplements that can be tried. Um, and it's just a matter of trying to get the right amount and finding the right process. So. Those are, those are some of the options, anyway, that I know of that um, might be helpful for people that have um, leaky gut. Hmm. That's good. Um, all right, and moving on to um, uh, the, uh, heavy, the heavyweight drugs for uh, MS, um, the interferons. Um, I, I've seen this question a lot myself, where people are approaching their treatment date for CCSBI, and they're like, should I keep taking, you know, should I keep taking my pills? I know personally I was on Rebif and, and it's a blood thinner as I understand it, you know, and so, or who, that's my understanding of it. So, you know, what, what do you do if you're, if you're on these drugs and you're approaching a CCSBI treatment date and you're going to be given blood thinners or other, any other drugs, do you, should you go off it for a time? And, and what about going off it permanently? What guide, guidance mm -hmm. can you give to uh, pulling off of one of these heavyweight drugs? Okay, so I think, you know, it would seem to me that there should be some, rec wherever you're going to have your procedure, there should be some recommendation given to you on what those, the people there expect of you in terms of whether you stay on your drug or you don't. Uh, that would that most patients when they go for surgery of any kind are told if you're taking this, this, or this. Mm -hmm. And when they're dealing with a group of MS patients, the vast majority of I suspect are on drugs like this. So you would think that there would be some general guidelines given to each person prior to them going. I don't know if that happens, but that would seem to me to be a reasonable expectation if you were going to a clinic that you know, deals with patients that are likely to be on these particular drugs. And I don't know specifically if they tell you to stop or not, but there is no, um, the most common interactions or worries with things like interferon containing products are not specifically blood thinners, but are more other immune suppressants, mm -hmm. other drugs which are going to affect your immune system, whether it's prednisone or any other. Um, there are a few others, but in general, the interactions aren't as direct as some of the interactions that you would see. And they stay so, in your body a long time, these well, interferons. Do. Don't, so if you went off a week before, no. it's not going to do anything. Some of, them, some of them last you know, up to three months. So it mm -hmm. depends on which drug you're on, how long they last. Um, whether you're on um, yeah, Rebif or on your, whether you're on Tisabri or whether you're on some of the newer ones. It just, it just varies from, pers you know, from drug to drug. So stopping it a day before may or may not make any difference whatsoever, depending on what you're on. So I don't know. what For people that have had CCSVI, what have they been told? Anything? Nothing. No, nope. just to give a list of medications yeah. that you're on. I guess they would have alerted us if there was any. But well, you know, online, people are yeah. all coming up with their own formulas of what, should, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And, mm -hmm. and uh, well, there's there's nothing hard and fast as far as I can find. I don't know, Bill, if you've got any thoughts on that or whether, but in general, the, the types of interactions, specific interactions that you see with interferons that, that couldn't be overridden or couldn't be watched for in, in a surgery circumstance are not, um, they're, they're not the kinds of things you would generally encounter yeah. in surgery. Well, in, in most cases, it, it isn't affecting <coughs> a huge amount. And I think, you know, the, the early studies of people with MS, when they were on medication. Dr. Paolo Zamboni took the standpoint that we did not want to interrupt the regular care of medication in that individual. And, and most often, the interventional <coughs> radiologists and vascular surgeons have worked around it because, just as you say, they're not huge factors in the uh, clotting issue 
or in any of the healing aspects per se of the actual blood vessel challenge. Fortunately, it's a pretty non-invasive procedure and it's only on the low pressure venous side, so that really helps. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest challenge, and of course many people going for CCSDI have secondary progressive or primary progressive. We have no drugs for primary mm -hmm. progressive and we have very, very few for secondary progressive. So it's only pretty much in the relapsing remitting that we talk about these mm -hmm. key uh, drug elements. And then it's very much an individual decision. Sometimes the relationship ends between the neurologist yeah. just because of having the intervention. So then it's, uh, then it's sorted out. And so people are really in a dilemma where to go yeah. with it. And, and I'm sympathetic with that. Um, it depends where you want to sit on the road. The immune system is still involved, but it's probably in later in the game than we used to think as far as initiating the illness. Yeah. You know, I, and I wonder if maybe you could help us with, I've got a, a young woman, she's breastfeeding now, she's going for her procedure in about five weeks, and she will, her, her uh, second child will then be six weeks old, she'd like to continue breastfeeding, and so her question is, you know, the clinic she's going to, I think, uses Pradax or Pradaxa, depending on which mm -hmm. country you're in. Um, and what would be her suggestions with regard to the breastfeeding withdrawal for that, or for the other drugs that are typically used in that particular clinic, which would be fentanyl, the opiate, pretty clean opiate, and, and midazolam. That's usually what the main drugs are used. Yeah. And then the big question is, you know, the other issues. And so maybe, Maybe she should use low-dose heparin if they want to use an anticoagulant yeah. as opposed to Pradax. Yeah, you know, I'm not 100% sure yet with with or products, and, and I can find that out actually, but I'm not. Uh, and I'll look. Well, I, I suspect. Breast milk? I'm not sure because it's not a drug that I've. It's not been around no, that long, and I'm just not sure about that. Certainly with um, fentanyl and midazolam, although they're both really short acting once you've stopped using them, um, you know, generally speaking, with those classes of drugs. Uh, they can get into breast milk and they can cause drowsiness in the baby and that sort of thing. But in, I would say, especially in midazolam, it'll probably be gone fast enough that she probably doesn't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Fentanyl, um, she might I would just watch for symptoms, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think I would stop breastfeeding for that reason. But the Davigatron or the products, I just, I'm not sure, but I can certainly find out. Yeah. Um, I think that's and, one that people would yeah, like to know because yeah. it's a pretty new drug to Yeah, with. it is. And we don't I, like warfarin certainly in that scenario. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> when he's warfarin, but, um, but, but yeah, I'm not sure about dabigatrin. And in, a lot of times, and if I'm not mistaken, I think it makes some comment about you know it shouldn't be used unless it absolutely has to. So it's sort of vague because they probably don't know that much yet. But I will see if I can find anything concrete to, mm -hmm. to send to you. Yeah, that would be. Yeah. Good. Yes, it, it is always tricky, and it's um, the, the the anticoagulants that might just be an opening into it because yeah. um, there was a question in there yep. somewhere about dabigatrin or about one. Yeah, <laughs> I don't remember which what the question was, but well, I mean, there's a couple. Oh, okay, but in right, terms right. of the interferon and anticoagulants, um, when you're on um, any of these DMDs, you often get an associated fever with with the injection, and I was instructed, that, as I'm sure a lot of people, that you take Tylenol or you take Advil, you mm -hmm. don't take aspirin. Yeah. And yet, we're now on baby aspirin, so if, okay. you know. <laughs> yeah, so the, if the question is, you know, what is the safest um, pain reliever to take for mm -hmm. things like, well, I think this lady has the a next sore neck or yeah. a headache or whatever, if you're on any kind of blood thinner, probably the safest thing to take well, in, in regular doses would be acetaminophen or a Tylenol-like product. Almost everything else that you can buy over the counter, whether it's aspirin or even the anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or naproxen or whatever, they all have the ability to decrease the person's um, time to stop bleeding. So they might notice it's, it's simple and it's small amount, and mm -hmm. you're taking low-dose aspirin, and I'll talk about that in a second, but for pain control, you're going to be taking higher doses. Yeah. It could increase um, the effect of the um, anticoagulant so for, some, that's for that's a short it. period of time. Yeah. So and, and also, it can cause stomach irritation, which increases your risks when you're on an anticoagulant of having an un, uh, of, of, of bleeding or having some uh, having some damage. So you don't want to take those if you don't have to. Yeah. 
I would definitely say don't take aspirin, but I also would go as far as to say don't take ibuprofen or some of the others. If acetaminophen works, that's the way to go. The rest of them all have the potential risk of changing, uh, you know, of, of causing stomach irritation and the complications of that with a with a blood thinner, and or um, you know, changing the, the uh, effects, increasing the effects to a point where you don't want it to be of the blood thinner. Not by an interaction, but just because they both, they all work to thin blood in a different way. So what you end up with when you take aspirin or even to some degree anti-inflammatories is that you do actually see, even if you weren't taking the blood thinner, your blood actually becomes a little bit um, less capable of clotting. Not, mm. not so much that it's a severe thing for you, obviously, because we use these drugs all the time, but in combination with that mm -hmm. blood thinner, it could be. And certainly because a lot of people are, so it sounds to me like you have your procedure and then you're kind of <laughs> dispersed and you may or may not have any kind of medical follow-up, I think you're running more risks if you use aspirin or NSAIDs or, or the anti-inflammatories, but I would suggest you start with, with the Tylenol. Mm -hmm. And, and the baby aspirin with the... The baby aspirin, the baby aspirin is there for a whole other reason. It's a small amount and it's there as a long-term protection for you um, to decrease the chance of a, of a clot forming. And there is increased risk of using um, an, an anticoagulant or a blood thinner and baby aspirin at the same time. There's, every time you use two things that can thin your blood, um, you do increase risks of you know problems, mm -hmm. but it's a balancing act, and usually, and for most people, they can use the two together. But they do have. I, I would say you should be very aware of what the signs of bleeding would be, so that if like you just have, just like so just like bruising. Like a bruise. <laughs> <laughs> well, bruising is one thing, but um, also off the, the type of bleeding that you might have might be internal, so you mm -hmm. might not actually see it. It wouldn't it wouldn't be just like you, if you mm -hmm. cut yourself, you might take longer to bleed. Or if you're in a car accident, that might be a problem. But sometimes the bleeding is internal as well, and so there are, there are signs to look for that. As well. and, and you just have to be careful. Mm -hmm. And yes. Well, and, and I think the one thing, and I've suggested it, you know, to some people certainly is to, because it's not maybe the best idea to take the ibuprofen, the other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug because it's got its mm -hmm. stomach upset effects, but so does Pradax or Pradaxa. Mm -hmm. And if you add two of them, mm -hmm. now you've got a stomach upset, you don't know what it's from. So mm -hmm. that's why I suggest to people, maybe a wise thing before they go, is to get some equivalent to or Tylenol 3s or some, some mm -hmm. codeine in addition to the Tylenol, because the Tylenol will not be enough in everybody. Yeah, yeah. And you're not gonna have the ability or right. you might be wise not to have the ability of adding the ibuprofen or the naproxen. Yeah. yeah, and some people do have quite a, you know, quite a, a, a severe neck mm -hmm. pain, and not everyone, but but some people it bothers yeah. them for a and few weeks. And there would be no problem with using choline or any of the other. It doesn't affect yeah. the blood. So for those of you in Canada, if you didn't get your Tylenol freeze in advance, you could buy the over-the-counter ones and use them, but again, get the ones that have the acetaminophen, not the... You're not, not supposed to carry them into the states, though, right? You're not supposed to carry. You can have enough for personal, personal use. use. Oh, personal use. Okay. It's the people that come in and buy 500, <laughs> 100, or 200 tablet bottles and go home and distribute them that they don't want to discourage. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, what about the bruising that goes on? Um, you know, we all, yeah. you know, uh, the injection or the insertion point or whatever you want to call it in the leg. Some people have developed large bruising that extends up to their midriff. Again, it's, it can be painful. There can be a lasting bump under the skin. Um, uh, this uh, question came in, a woman, she's on a combination of both Plavix and aspirin and uh, is uh, um, bruising severely. Um, my, uh, my experience was that people with the Pradaxa uh, also bruise severely afterwards. Uh, and, and these, you know, these bruises are um, localized to where the catheter went in, but again, they grow. They, you know, yeah. they, they, people saw them creep up their midriff. Okay, so, so I guess I have to say first off that just by nature of these drugs, there is going to be some bruising. Now, you don't want it to be extensive or problematic, but it's almost impossible not to have in most people and large, especially when you've had procedures and then you're also on which are you know simple on some levels, but also 
uh, have pressure involved and people fiddling around with, with uh, various areas. So you're, you're bound to have some bruising. Um, and anything that reduces the effectiveness of the anticoagulant is going to cause a problem. So anything that would um, you know, minimize how effective it was, that, that's not an option. So one of the things that has been tried, and it's been successful in some people and not in others, is actually a homeopathic approach to trying to prevent bruising um, and using um, arnica pre-surgery and after. And arnica is a, the idea behind homeopathy is it's kind of, is that it has, uh, that you're, bought, you're giving the person um, dilute amounts of things which at high doses would cause the same thing that they're trying to counteract. So especially for things like trauma, um, arnica has has been used and, and has some. It, it's got. It's an individual thing. Let's put it that way. The How evidence is spelled that. It's A R N I C A. A R N I C A. Okay. And you can get it in tablet form that's dissolved under the tongue. And so there are um, doses that you can use of that prior to surgery and after that have been used for many many years as an attempt to try and decrease bruising. Whether or not it will work is, is hard to say because it's it's not a, sort of a traditional way of approaching things. Uh, for other kinds of bruising, you can get arnica in a gel that can be massaged in, but not onto the open area, just on the, the bruised skin around, which might also... Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't think yeah. they, people are getting the bruise right at the point no, where no, the no. catheter goes in. It yeah, gets hot, so you higher. wouldn't put it on the catheter area, but you would put it on, uh, on the other area. And that's a possibility. Um, what about... Higher doses of vitamin C. Would that have any effect well, on bruising? It's possible, but you would have to do it in advance. It wouldn't. Doing it right then isn't helpful because the the effect that vitamin C has is to stabilize the tissue so that it doesn't bruise. To to, to mm -hmm. sort of make the um, blood vessels um, stronger, if you like, or less fragile, less able to to be damaged. And so you you can't just take it before you go. It's something that you would Build have up. to prepare for over time uh, beforehand. You know, I would say, yes. Well, and, and I think vitamin C is an interesting one too, because certainly, you know, I mean, the Bulgarian study, three, some 350 patients, they said that people with significant bruising near the site or advanced mm -hmm. to it are mm -hmm. a little less than 2%. That's probably in the almost the same range that we see the so-called ITP or idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, meaning folks that have some bruising and bumping easily mm -hmm. because their platelets aren't quite optimal function. And, and one of the suggestions that you might try for that is, you know, maybe a couple weeks ahead of time or maybe ideally long term, is taking some vitamin C because in a few people it will help resolve that. Yeah. Just as you say. Yeah. So, I, but I think that the, the, the trick with vitamin C is taking it beforehand. Yeah, <laughs> you know, a couple weeks. Of and, weeks. and it's hard to know because then you won't know if it works or doesn't work because you don't know what you would have done without it. But the point is it's healthy, it's not going to hurt you, and why not? Give and it you a probably try. know if you're susceptible to bruising, yeah, you know, just absolutely. generally and, speaking. And, you know, the older a person gets, you know, and again, people who are having this procedure are all age groups, I suspect. And so there are people that just by virtue of the fact that they're older are going to bruise a bit more easily anyway, perhaps, or maybe they've used, um, I don't know, steroid skin creams for something where their skin and their tissue is a bit more. So there's all kinds of reasons why people bruise. So everyone's going to have a slightly different response to, to what's going on. Yeah. The vitamin C is a reasonable thing to try to. And then just ice the bruise itself yeah. for the yeah. pain relief. Or I guess any of the other pain relief things that you talked about would yeah. work for yeah. bruising. Well, they wouldn't. They would. They would reduce the pain of the bruising if the, if the bruising was painful, but they wouldn't reduce the bruising. No. Part. No. Okay. Yeah. And what about that lump under the skin that happens for some people? Oh, I'm actually not really 100% sure what to do about that. <laughs> okay. In fact, I'm going to go. No. <laughs> you know, and there's all kinds of things that you could try, but whether or not anything's really going to make an effect or not. Uh, but certainly, I've uh, sometimes massage even just working it because mm -hmm. it is a just a hardened patch, just gently will help. But it, it varies. Okay. Person to person. All right. So, anything else on the bruising? No. Uh, and this um, Plavix question, uh, she wants to know if uh, she can cut the pill in half to to, um, <laughs> to decrease the chance of excessive bruising. She's been on it 
ah plavix for four weeks and eighty milligrams of aspirin a day. and so she's going on four weeks and she's supposed to continue on them. she doesn't say for how much longer but um basically does she have to change those medications if she's getting excessive bruising? ah not necessarily because aspirin and plavix both alone can cause bruising. so when you use the two of them together you do run increased risks she can't reduce the dose that she uses or she's not that well without some consultation because she's not going to get the full benefit of the plavix if she does ah i guess you could cut the tablet in half and take half and half but i'm not sure if that would make any difference to the overall bruising um plavix is traditionally taken once a day so it's going to have a long effect so even if you stagger it you're likely to be getting over a period of twenty four hours the same amount and it's likely to have a similar effect so that's the plavix and the asa are not traditionally used together but are more commonly becoming combinations if you were to talk sort of be really pure about it people will say well why would you use both because they both do similar things and usually often times if someone doesn't do well on aspirin they'll be put on plavix as an alternative but more and more frequently i'm seeing the two used together which does certainly increase the risk of of um bruising did it she didn't actually say why she was on it well she had the treatment was it post stent and only that because there are lots she actually doesn't have a stent okay and so this is more aggressive than some um some other clinics are doing that that don't have yeah so this is the thing is every clinic is is describing some different protocol you know it's hard for me to say whether she needs the two of them together or one would be sufficient that's not really i can't really sit there except to tell you that for other types of stenting or procedures that are similar um it isn't that common for the two to be used together usually there's one and then they switch over or it's only or the or the plavix is only used for a short period of time and then they switch to asa if they can so i i don't know enough about what's going on here to really well i i think it's interesting too because i i think you need to look at the clinics that you're going to and see what's their experience because many of them are started up more recently and they're taking their anticoagulant concepts the same as they do for coronary angioplasty and or stinting in the coronary vessel where it's much more a disaster to get a small clot forming and it goes down and lodges in the heart and now you've got a full-blown heart attack so you know i think we we need to look at it because it would seem without a stint you know more than a couple of weeks seems inordinate yeah that's what i thought because you know i do have a stent and and i only stayed on pradaxa two weeks and so well that's that's why i mean it's hard for me to say and probably for you too it just bill it it it's it seems like a long time that's why i don't know enough to be able to really say for sure because i there might be something else about her that we don't know maybe she has some sort of heart issue or maybe she's at risk of stroke maybe there's something else we don't know about that so i'm sorry where you are i can't i don't know for sure she said just call me susan not my real name however it's you know it is a long time and yes but there is a lot of controversy now even in sort of a sort of more traditional cardiovascular areas as to how long you keep someone on plavix after different types of procedures and so sometimes it's up to a year sometimes it's up to three months sometimes it's 30 days and it kind of depends on what's going on so they might just be being very very conservative well i know that one of the one of the decisions that that i had to face coming back and being on on pradax or pradaxa was my my doctor telling me that um you know there's no uh there's no antidote to it if you were in a trauma traumatic situation if you were you know hit hit by a bus or something like that and you started to bleed out like it would be it would be harder for the emergency people to get your bleeding under control when you're on a heavy duty um blood thinner like that and um and and you know and not that i'm going to go out and bicycle and get into accidents but you know i really you i mean it is a new drug isn't it and i mean why is pradaxa so different than than the other blood thinners well what is it doing for for a body for your blood to clot it's a very complex process there are all kinds of things that have to fall in, fall into place one after another a process to get a clot yeah. to form and so all anticoagulants affect that clotting process at different spots they attack and um so the reason that something like 
products is is popular or is becoming more popular is because the usual alternative, which is warfarin, um, is problematic to stabilize. So the dose is very individualized. It has to be monitored. You have to monitor, you have to blood tests. I mean, it's, it's a great drug for certain things, and when that's all you had, but something like Pradex gives people, a, it's a bit easier for them to take, and it's a bit more um, consistent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I would comment, too, from the emergency trauma room, they will get the bleeding stopped oh, yeah. by replacing blood products. I think that's an overreaction that you were oh. handed, mm -hmm. Sandra, uh, because it it will gradually continue to replace warfarin. Warfarin affects factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 is the vitamin K antagonist. It doesn't do us well for a lot of reasons, including osteoporosis. So, you know, Predax, by giving certain blood products and enough blood, you'll get the bleeding stopped. I think that's an overreaction that yeah. it's lethal. And, 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 it's, and it's just maybe an unknown because it is newish here? Or? Sure. And remember, the idea isn't to make you gush blood. No. <laughs> it's to is to just delay slightly your ability to clot so that you don't form a clot. Because blood, when it gets sluggish or if it gets caught on something or stuck, if it sits still for a period of time, it starts to clot. That's what it does. So all it is, so using blood thinners isn't to make it so that you never clot and that you just you know bleed. It's to just slow the formation of the clot in a controlled way so that you are at less risk of forming one when you're not supposed to. It doesn't mean you can't form a clot at any point. It just means that um, it, it, it just delays that time frame, makes it longer, a little bit harder. So it's not a, an all or nothing thing. It, it's, a, it's actually a fine balance that they're trying to achieve between having you not form a clot when you really don't need it <laughs> and allowing you to have one if and when you, you do. So there's a, it's, it's not a, an all or nothing. So is it the same drugs that you're put on if you do form a thrombus if you know if you if you get something in your stent or in your jugular vein and 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 they say okay you've got this clot forming there is it just more of the same drugs that you're you're kept on um, in part i think in more likely well I, I don't know for sure but in many cases when someone really forms a clot they'll often give them an injectable form of an anticoagulant of like one of the low molecular weight heparins so um, and and then at some point, they either get them back, then once they sort of have made progress, they'll either stabilize them on an oral form or whatever, but in nor usually at the beginning, they'll be fairly aggressive and they'll use something um, in an injectable form. And is that, is that learned on the arterial side, where we've been dealing with arterial clots and everything is, so we're sort of applying what we've known about, you know, taking care of artery side? to the venous side is well it's not I mean they do do other processes on the venous side so they well, have you need some to tell that certainly <laughs> but 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 the vast majority of you know where we get a lot of this is from surgeries mm -hmm. on um, you know replacements of various parts ah, of um, and also cardiovascular um, and that would be mostly the arterial side that they would be doing. Because they've been doing interventions on the venous side for yeah. twenty and thirty yeah. years. Yeah of course this is not new. No. This is not new, and but the new ground is that people that are work primarily on the arterial side are now moving into the venous side, and so they're trying to take the wisdom and information that they've experienced on the arterial side to the venous side, and that's why you know an interventional radiologist has been doing it 20 and 30 years already should be learning from their wisdom because they're working in the low pressure system, they're right. working with the clots occurring and all these issues. And so that's, you know, I, I think we're going through that growing phase, mm -hmm. everybody getting on the same page. Excellent. So are there any, um, there's no questions coming in from? No, sorry, dear. Oh. No? no? All right, questions. well, we just have one question left then, Lynn. Um, and so we'll just put that invitation if you've been waiting to ask a question and uh, you want to jump in, you're online, please type it in and, and Landon will read it out to me. But this one, um, you said you'd pronounce this one for me, so I'll let oh. <laughs> So this person was interested in the fibrinolytic properties of natokinase. So fibrinolytic, uh, fibrin is one of the components or one of the processes that goes that your body goes through the production of a clot. So fibrin is part of that. And so fibrinolytic means that, it, that this product will break that 
um, fibrin or block the production of that fibrin in a way that uh, will help it as an anti-clotting agent, I guess. Is so it's natokinase. And it's natokinase. N-A-T-T-O-K-I-N-A-S-E. N-A-T-T-O-K-I-N-A-S-E. Yeah. Right. And you can tell that it's what we call an enzyme because kinase or A's at the end of something often means an enzyme. And an enzyme is often, in the body, is, is often a, a substance which breaks something down and may or may join two things together. In other words, it's kind of a, a facilitator of change in the body in, in various processes. So natokinase is actually an enzyme that is, comes from soybean and uh, has been discussed. We use, we use all types of kinases as such, <laughs> streptokinase, etc., uh, in uh, trying to break clots when people are having um, heart attacks and that sort of thing. So kind of clot busters. Mm -hmm. So the natokinase isn't as well known as some of the others that are used in uh, traditional sense, in, in our traditional medicine. Um, but there are a number of things. Uh, there's there are small, uh, smaller, and but significant benefit um, shown in certain cases where they've been using it. They've been using it in ophthalmology, uh, in um, uh, some of the procedures where they're trying to uh, affect clot formation in, in, in some of the, the ophthalmological procedures. So there are some benefits potentially to it. Um, it's not widely used, but that's basically how it works. And it's a prescription drug, is it? Well, you know, to be honest, I've not ever seen it ever. I think you can buy it over the counter in most, you know, in, I don't know if you can buy it in health food stores in Canada, but certainly in the States I know you can. Um, so I'm not sure, to be quite honest. Um, but uh, it sort of falls into that group of drugs that are, are enzymes which are there in this particular case to try and decrease clot formation. The, the evidence that I've seen has been somewhat positive in certain circumstances, and there were some studies in some of that sort of traditional medical literature on using natokinase, particularly in ophthalmology, but I haven't seen it used in a large way in any other area. But, you know, there might be people that are more familiar with it than I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. But, um, but it's something to look at. I'm not, I, I, I don't feel that I'm at, in a position to be able to say, take it or don't take it, or you know it's safe or it isn't safe. Uh, I don't have enough information on it. Although what I did see seemed reasonably okay. Um, but I really honestly don't feel that I can say one way or another for sure. But that's basically what it is. And whether or not that would help uh, with your treatment, I would be, um, I, I would not. I, I, I Just because of the anticoagulants you're going to be using and all the other things that you're going to be given, I would stay away from it around, if you're looking at it as a round procedure itself, I would not use it. Right. And Landon, if there are, are there questions coming in at all? Nope, sorry. Nobody wants any questions. Well, then what we're going to do is we're just going to take this uh, time to thank Lynn for um, her uh, expertise and her uh, willingness to dive into these questions for us. Have we got all of them? No, I'm just going to... Oh, to oh there, there is one. <laughs> Okay, so there's one at the very bottom, and, and people are, um, this one is basically... Just trying to be subtle. <laughs> this person was just saying that um, she doesn't know where to go uh, for answers, because um, it's very hard to talk to our doctors about, you know, how can I thin my blood after my CCSVI treatment, when perhaps your doctor didn't support you going for the treatment in the first place, um, and, uh, and, you know, how do you... Um, how do you get some good advice and what are your recommendations as a, as a health practitioner when you're having a tough time getting your health team to, to be on your side over some of the choices that you're making? Yeah. So where do you go for help? That, that's, a, that's a tough question because I would say that where if, if even with the seven of you in the room here, if you all picked someone that you could go to for help that might be a different person in a different profession or not even in a profession. <laughs> it's very difficult when you're in a situation where you don't have, either don't have a family physician or don't work well with the physician that you have for various reasons or you uh, don't have a pharmacist that you can talk to or someone in the know who could give you at least, even if they don't know the answer, are willing to work with you. So I think first off, trying to find someone who 
let's face it, a lot of this is groundbreaking in a sense, right? It's new. They're, it, it's pushing some of the conservative medical people in a direction that they're not that comfortable with. But that's okay if the person's willing to work with you to try and figure it out. It's m maybe not so okay if the, the line's drawn. So I would say you don't always need the person that knows the most, but the person that has the most open mind that is willing to work with you. So if there's someone within your realm, whether it's your doctor or a nurse practitioner or you know a friend who has a medical background or your pharmacist, um, someone who can help you put at least look at the information with you and help you come to a decision that you, that's right. Because a lot of the decisions that you're going to make are not, they're not, there's not a lot of evidence to support one one answer or another. It's really whether or not you want to move in that direction to try something for yourself that might be a little bit out of the box, a little bit different. Um, so you really need to have some sense of, you know, what are my risks? What are my benefits potentially? Um, you know, what are the ups? What are the downs? And, and having finding someone within that. So I, I can tell you, in, because I am a pharmacist and that um, you know, a lot of people, and I'll just say that a lot of people, I think pharmacists are underutilized in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who choose your pharmacy because they give air miles and you don't know the pharmacist, <laughs> no, not that I would say anything because I don't, I don't work we in the pharmacy. We took some great so. trips. <laughs> but, but seriously, it, what I'm trying to say is, you know, there are people out there that you can connect with, but choose the people that you use as your health practitioners wisely up front because then you'll have resources when you need them. And it's a little trickier with a doctor because in Victoria, where we are, there are no physicians <laughs> that are taking new patients, it seems. So you're kind of stuck. You might be ending up in the clinic. But they are not the case everywhere. So for other people out there who, you know, certainly your, physician, your family physician will play a big role, if not your neurologist. So but maybe choose a pharmacist but, the but way you when would you choose, choose a your family doctor. Choose someone not because they have the cheapest dispensing fee, but someone who actually knows who you are and who will be willing to look at the information with you and sort of help put some perspective on it for you. Because sometimes that's all you can really ask for. You're not going to find in a lot of the questions that you have, what is, what's the right answer? Because there's no right answer a lot of the time. The answer really depends on you, you know, how much risk are you willing to take, how do you feel, are you already taking 25 things a day, you know, tablets a day, do you really want to add another? You know, there's all kinds of questions you have. And so you need to find someone that can kind of give you that. Um, opportunity to lay out the pros and cons, even if they don't have the answers, because probably for some of your questions, no one really has the answer. They just have ways that you can move. So I don't know if that's a very good answer to your question, but <laughs> whoever asked it, but you know, it, it is hard to find. But choose the people involved in your healthcare carefully, no matter who they are, even if you think it's just a place that you're going to get something and you want to go to the place that gives you the cheapest or the fastest or whatever. That's not necessarily because that not necessarily the, the way to go. And and um, if people had follow up questions from today, Lynn. Um, um, so the, the other part of the question was, could I answer some questions yeah. if they needed it? And yeah. certainly, I'm willing to do that. Probably the best way to do that. And I don't know what all the answers, obviously, <laughs> but I'm willing to help you look at at, at it just as best I can. But. Probably the best way is to link in through yeah. um, your organization yeah. and then you'll pass that on. Yeah, okay. just email me, Sandra at nationalccsbisociety.org, and I'll make sure Lynn gets your question. We have a question from the floor. Um, if, if you're finished with what you're mm -hmm. sort of doing there, um, another pill or whatever that's, that's been, been coming out uh, is, I think it's called Procarin. Is it Procarin? It's, it's a combination of histamine and caffeine. It's okay. another thing you yes. can show you. Yes, you know what? Procarin, I, oh, jeez, where did I see it years ago? I see it used in a couple of odd situations. Go ahead, yes. Uh, I just wondered if you knew anything about it and had anything to say about it. It just seems to me very strange to combination. Because we have and too much histamine in our body already. Uh, that's was my understanding as people with MS. We have, I remember my first neurologist giving me a journal article on that, that people with MS have like six times the histamine in their body. Bill. Well, Procarin, you know, came out of, I think, mm -hmm. primarily Washington State, and it was used uh, for a considerable period of time, and if you read uh, Marie Rhodes' book, CCSVI, The Science Behind It, mm -hmm. uh, 
it's discussed in there in, in some degree. And of course, histamine is a modest vessel, you know, enhancement. It's a vasodilator. All right, and that may well be why some people improve. Because if we take CCSVI or relative vein blockages as being one of the instigating or worsening features toward multiple sclerosis and a number of other neurodegenerative diseases, then some of these short-term acting histamine opening up the vessels may be a piece of why some people improve. Because some people are much more responsive than others. And histamine is definitely a vasodilator. That is why when you get huge histamine release, you, you get it. huge swelling. Yeah. You get leaky vessels, but you also get expansion vessels. So, you know, contrary to the measurement of histamine, which is a very up and down thing, almost minutes transitory, you know, so that's where Procarin came from. It's never been People have always had to get it from a U.S. pharmacy. I don't think it's, it was ever made uh, here. Like I just, you know, years ago we used it, and I don't remember why. To be honest, it wasn't yeah. in MS patients, and we we it, it just hasn't was in the reaches, the far reaches of my memory of having yeah. um, provided for care. But the fact that it also has histamine and it also runs risks for some people, so that's another thing to consider. Sure, and not not everybody will do well with it. Yeah. But uh, it, it was just, it, it has been coming up, and, and my other, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's also got caffeine in it, which I sort of went, well, if, you know, if you give anybody a shot of caffeine, don't, don't they all of a sudden start feeling better? So, <laughs> uh, yeah. that's, that, that's what I was wondering. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Landon, you've got something there? Well, somebody is just uh, saying that they were having a tough time getting the chat working, and they finally got through to me, so. Oh, okay. Okay, in the social stream area, oh, let's see where we can, let's just go over to the social stream. No, that's not where we need to go. So, no questions then, Landon? Oh, hang on a minute, I'm seeing oh. thousands of questions here. Okay, so. Okay. <laughs> okay, Sandra, this is Michelle Met Metus. You, we're not using me. So. Oh, she, she said to say hi. So. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Frank So. Uh, Michelle, do you have some questions for us? Okay, Landon, is is there anything yeah, there? She then? says, yep, she does. So hang on just a moment. Okay. Perhaps while you're waiting for that question, you, uh, um, I always get very confused between an anticoagulant and a blood thinner, and um, you know, like after we have our procedure there's always this fear of getting a blood clot. Well, then what does a blood thinner have to do with blood clots forming or the propensity for the blood to form clots uh, versus, uh, you know, a blood thinner? So can you explain the two? So, so basically they're the same thing. Um, basically an anticoagulant is, a ter is the more proper term, I guess, if you want to call it that, for a group of drugs or substances, I guess, that, that will decrease the, the processing or somehow impede the, the speed with which or the ability of your blood to clot. We call them blood thinners because it's easier. <laughs> it's more of a lay term, and really they're the same thing. Okay. So, And we use them because we don't want you to clot, um, and so they'll, that's why it, they, they're Anticoagulants can also be used, like heparins, if you do clot, they do have, they will give you something very quickly to try and decrease the, um, the expansion of the clot or more clots from forming, that kind of thing, but that, they're basically talking about the same thing. Okay. Okay, my, my screen just disappeared on me, but I did see a question come back uh, on gluten and gluten-free and how how bad is it for us to go off gluten? If we've gone gluten free, and then we slip up a little bit, where, where does gluten fit in this entire equation? <laughs> That's probably Bill. You're going to. I'm going to let Bill do this yeah. one. <laughs> well, I mean, gluten's talked about a great deal, and and I was recently down to San Diego where Dr. Hubbard, you know, many of you will know as a neurologist, okay. and his son, his son's blood flow somehow improved 50 percent in his veins when he went off dairy and gluten. And gluten, of course, we've known, the University of Maryland did some really nice studies on it, 
showing that many people have neurologic issues with gluten and there's a number of those you know documented in the literature. Nearly a third of people will have neurologic issues with gluten. Gluten of course raises something in the body called zonulin. Zonulin enhances the or worsens the problem of leaky gut. It also worsens the problem of a leaky blood-brain barrier. So why are we much more sensitive to gluten seeming than we were in the past? And the suggestion that I you know think maybe a piece of it I was recently at a major nutrition conference in San Francisco. We had a really excellent discussion on the um, genetically modified foods and of course proteins are the primary irritant when you're going to have food sensitivities and the proteins that they were suggesting which are documented in animals and humans to worsen leaky gut are genetically modified soy and corn. So if one wants to reduce that sensitivity or the leaking of the gut so that the protein chunks of gluten may be getting less into the bloodstream, then you would go for organic components of either one of those because then that's about the only way you could find you to do Because maybe that is why the gluten sensitivity seems to be much more prevalent today. You can go into other things and they did, you know, is it more gluten in the grains and all these other issues but it's not so much uh, felt to be that's the factor. I wonder if it's a combination of things, but the genetically modified products we're much more getting may be the work part that's weakening the gut. Some of us will do well off gluten. You can go and get a lab test to see what your genetic alleles are mm -hmm. for gluten. If you want to, that's one route, because many people will not adapt until they get the gluten sensitivity. I think it goes back really well to what Lynn suggested earlier, try it for one or even three months yourself to see what difference it makes. If I, st I mean, I went back on gluten after my treatment and I did not do well, so I went off it again. If I stay off gluten, my neurologic pain of my multiple sclerosis stays away. So different people have different effects and components with it. It is a piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And maybe it is a piece of the flow issue, but that's only a single anecdotal thing of one individual, but maybe it's one of the subtleties that, you know, ebbs and flows, worsens the degree of flow or restriction of flow that some of us have. It, it's almost easier to take a pill to try to offset a symptom than it is to avoid something in our diet, and, oh. and, and because sure. avoiding something in our diet takes work. That's because we're lazy. We're yeah. lazy. Exactly. It takes work to, uh, to adhere to a particular diet where you know, and, and so, you know, what what I find is, uh, you know, um, you know, you do slip, you know, these things, and, and, and Lynn and I, we were talking about uh, even compliance with the supplements and, and prescription drugs that we have isn't so great. The literature on, on, you know, you know, when people are prescribed something, they don't take it the way it's prescribed, and they don't take it, you know, they swap pills with other people and do all sorts of nightmare things for pharmacists, and and so, you know, we often look at these things and say it's not working, but, you know, are we putting the work into it? Like, are we actually taking it as prescribed or taking it as recommended? And, and, and you know, something like gluten comes up, and that is something that is, is, is a lot of work on our part. And, and when people cop out from it, it's often not a matter of the food not tasting good. We have gluten-free cookies here today, and... I hope they're not all going to be gone, but they look good. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the, you know the the gluten-free bakery here in town, you mm -hmm. know, says they have 28 different grains they make they make foods with. You know, I mean, they're very tasty. And and so, you know, how much effort are we willing to put into it? I think is the comment here says Vancouver is super gluten-free friendly. Yes. Okay, a couple more questions uh, that I've got here it says uh, I'm also curious about exercise and heart rate. Do we have to be mindful of how high we take up our heart our heart rate up and or should we be trying to get our heart rate up higher to keep our blood flowing? Well that's an interesting one. I, I can comment on that because when I joined Curbs, she, she was my, my resting heart rate is really low. And and she said, throw away the chart, because she said if we get you up to 178 beats a minute, like you know, she said it's just like way too high. And I think isn't that heart rate chart being like, isn't it being reissued because the, uh, 
uh, you know, the uh, aerobic zone that they used to have in every gym wall was was uh, was faulty. Like they, they said, it's not, like you said, there's too much individual variance for these heart rate charts. Well, I mean, uh, where are you trying to go? Yeah. You're going to need to do rehab. You're going to need to do exercise. Exercise is an important part of blood flow. But blood flow, when we're talking about veins, is not heart rate related. Mm -hmm. Your blood pressure is related to how much the heart squeezes out with one squeeze mm -hmm. and how many there are a minute. Yeah. If you're a tiny child, you're almost completely heart rate dependent to change your flow. But we're only talking flow in the arteries here yeah. and the blood pressure. So the only issue is don't be a weekend warrior with exercise and just do it a whole bunch all at once, very extreme, because that's more hassle or stress on the body than it is benefit. Mm -hmm. So the practical solution is everyone should have a physical trainer if they're going to need to do rehab post-intervention or even without intervention with CCSDI. So get a physical trainer and they will give you some very modest, reasonable guidelines which will work for you. Mm -hmm. Not only that, the heart rate issue is based on percentage of of your norm. So if your normal heart rate is 60, well, and you want to get it up to 70, well, that's different than if your normal heart rate is 70 and you want to get it up to 70. So there are variations based on what your norm is. So that would take that into account. And there probably are guidelines as to how high you should push it. At, you know, post surgery of any kind, etc. I don't know what those exactly are, but that's where uh, some guidance from a recreational therapist or someone at the gym or someone that can give you that kind of information would be useful. A trainer. Next question: uh, Does B venom therapy interfere with MS drugs? Good question. B venom. B venom. Well, B venom, not that I know of. Um, and I, as I think of what the Sort of, I'm trying to think of, of, of what the potential theoretical interaction would be if there was, but it's but not that I know of. Uh, it, and when I look at them, how one would work versus the other, I don't see where they would interact. No. But uh, if I find something different, I'll post it. Is that only being done in clinical trials now, B venom, or is it uh, out there? I suspect it's out there. But I'm not sure where. <laughs> I, I have not seen any. I don't know anyone who's had it. And, yeah. But um, I suspect. I used to talk to people about it 10 years yeah. ago, and yeah. I haven't hardly talked to anybody yeah. about it for the last time. Sort of falling off for yeah. a while. Okay. Yeah. Anything, Len? Yep. Hey, uh, this one actually is for, I think, a follow up question to Dr. Code. Um, read the fibrin comment that you made uh, about people with SPMS and PPMS, how, did, how can that be addressed and what was the medi medication? Well, I, I think were we talking about fibrin or we were actually talking about which drugs could be used <coughs> for those people? Uh, the and only place that we talked about natokinase and fibrin. Okay, yeah, and I wasn't into that particular discussion. No, much and so, yeah. you know, I'm not sure where we're going. So it's fibrin, F-I-B-R-I-N? Yes. Okay. We'll ask them for clarification. Okay. Or they, they've heard us if they're yes. still online. But there isn't any fibrin issues. I mean, fibrin is a part of blood clotting, but there isn't any differentiation within the whole spectrums of MS with fibrin or with blood clotting. Mm -hmm. There isn't any association there at all. The only association that seems to be different within the groups was when we were talking about iron and we talked about the hemochromatosis. Mm -hmm. Some subsets of hemochromatosis are more prone to have secondary progressive MS or primary progressive MS and more severe. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anything else there, Landon, on the? No, that appears to be it. So, okay, one, we have to wrap up here, Brandon. Okay, go ahead. Um, so we, we want to uh, thank Lynn very much for her participation. I got one more. Oh, yes, Landon. It says, Dr. Cota, I would like to know, with the emu oil, is the bird just used for the oil or is it used for other things? Oh, Both no. birds <laughs> mention that they do not carry emu oil for ethical reasons. Oh, right. oh. 
Well, you know, I think I'll defer. I think we should wrap up today. Okay. Session. I'm more than happy to answer that. People can purchase my book. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Lynn, for, for coming here today. And I'm sure our online audience is going to say thank you, too. We've got something here for you. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> he's, a, he's a CCSVI bear. Okay. He's wearing his little T-shirt. And, uh, and you can also get those at our Cafe Press store, if you like. It's cafepress.ca and then forward slash CCSVI. And, uh, and thank you so much for everything. And that's, our, that's it for today, everyone. We're signing off from Victoria. Everyone else, enjoy your weekend. Thank you. And the group online says thank you, too. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, bye, everybody. Bye. bye. <laughs> what are you doing? Good. You've been very busy. <laughs>